Today, at my high school basketball coach's request, I'm speaking to a seventh grade class and the students sit in their identical desks and look at me like I'm a blank chalkboard. I've come to talk about the war, but a jeans and sweater must not look the part, must not look how they want and expect a man to look after coming back. Luckily, I have videos and these seem to help. They seem to make it more real because war always seems more authentic when we can watch it on a screen like we do so often on our televisions and desktop computers. The kids giggle when I show them footage of Iraqi children hounding soldiers for candy, saying Mr. Mr. 111, and then diving into the brown ground when someone drops a piece. Near the end of the talk, I pull from my pocket a silver piece of twisted shrapnel, six inches long, heavy, and cold. To the kids, it could be a scrap of steel in their father's toolboxes, but I hold it up high, my thumb and index finger pressing against its rigid surface and I tell it its explosive story, the same story for every piece of shrapnel. The bomb went off as we drove into town, maybe by accident, maybe too early, but it went off and we drove to the boom because that was our job, to drive to booms and bullet pops. The blast blew out a wall, shattered a house's windows. Wolf and I picked up two pieces. He bragged how his was bigger than mine, almost a full foot. We couldn't hold the pieces because they were still hot from the detonation. So instead, we tossed them under the Humvee's hood to cool off, and everyone looked, imagining them in the air, flying bl blindly at our bodies of skin. Before handing the piece to the first student to feel, and pass around the room, I told them to be careful, don't cut yourself. And I hand it to a boy with peach fuzz on his chin. He holds it like a smelly sock. They pass it around like show and tell, testing its sharpness with their delicate fingers. When they're done, a girl, holding it carefully with both hands, hands it back to me, and I place it in my pocket, snug, safe, close to the skin it was meant to pierce and shred. Some of the kids, after passing it, wipe their hands together around their pant legs, as if wanting to say, yuck, yuck, passing it quickly to the next kid. You take it, you take it. One, at Fort Polk, Louisiana, the opposition force shoots all three of us, but we enjoy this death which gives us a chance to sit, smoke, rest our feet. Dying is part of training for war in Iraq. We leave in two months. Two, Uncle Neil hates that I'm going. He talks at the retirement home. My nephew is going to Iraq, saying the four letter word like food he's trying to spit out. Three, Killed when his convoy vehicle struck a roadside bomb. Killed when a roadside bomb hit his vehicle on a mountain patrol. Killed when his unit was ambushed with small arms fire. Killed four. On the slow computer in the internet and phone center, I say the names of the dead. Age, hometown, cause of death. IED, RPG, small arms, vehicle rollover things to be avoided. Five, home for Christmas leave. Yes, he's going to Iraq. He's leaving for Iraq. His unit is being mobilized for Iraq. He has to go to Iraq. I'll get you a drink, you're going to Iraq. Email me when you get to Iraq. Hopefully things will get better when you get to Iraq. Are you scared about going to Iraq? Did you know you would have to go to Iraq? I can't imagine going to Iraq. Is there a chance you might not go to Iraq? Where will you be in Iraq? What will you be doing in Iraq? How, will you, how long will you be in Iraq? Iraq, really, Iraq? Six, my chemistry professor asks why I'm withdrawing from class. She says, email your address, I'll send you guys cookies. Seven, at Ohio State with Jake and Larry, we walk from house to house, keg to keg, drink beers from a book bag. When I wake on white carpet in a living room, I'm not sure what has happened, but I'm still going to Iraq. Eight, Channels went home for Christmas. He never came back to brag. He's AWOL. LT says the marshals will find him within a week. Nine, asleep in the barracks. 3 a.m., two feet hit the floor. Someone runs. Tomorrow we will know it was Spencer to the lighted latrine. 
and three paces from my bunk, spew lashes across the red floor as if dumped from a bucket above. But he doesn't stop, vomit falling as he runs, and in the stall, after coughing up the rest, a slow breathing, cold water in the sink, he sucks it from a cupped hand again and again. 10. At the high school football game, Dan and John shake my hand. They stand in thick, unzipped jackets. When we lean left with the hundreds of heads, watching the ball in the air, soaring to our home end zone, I feel the tremors in my chest, the silent crowd inhaling to explode, the open mouths, the arms, the screams. The dust dances slowly across blue sky. We watch it through goggles, brown scarves cover our shaved faces. Hall takes a picture, Doc smashes his cigarette against the Humvee's armor. I watch LT's vehicle disappear. The storm, the storm seems to stand up two miles tall, then tear through us, leaving its dust and thin layers on our hands and dressing our black rifles and cloaks of khaki. While it passes through and we stand in its calm, constant cooing, the ground vanishes below our boots, and for a flickering moment we leave the earth and hover in sand against sand, enclosed in a dungeon of dust. In the land where all is forgotten, where no one remembers anything, birds cut off their beaks to share your sorrow, little torn shoe. Twice of half a moon throbbed, swollen. I don't know what you mourned. This tale was lost among the chestnut trees where I found it and brought it to you. Little bird of many colors, you were the kind who confuses wondering with wandering. You wander around. Under your braids, a bright light. Little pink apple, life does not taste as good as it should. After all, there is always something better. We choose the best of what is before us, but much is not before us. In the story, a boy chose the horse called Thought over the one called Wind. Thinking swiftly, he rode to you. His sack of apples turned to a sack of rats, his sack of pears to parrots repeating happy, happy, happy. Little gold pin, many things we tell our children are kind but not true. The reverse is also true. You were crying in the chestnut trees. There was no telling the leaves from the leaf-shaped spaces between them. I don't know what you mourned, little winter deer, the birds mute and bleeding all around you. I know you want to forget that last part. And here a cup got broken. Everyone should now go home. When she leaves the path, the forest opens for her like a picture book minus the story in which she has a deer for a brother and braids him a leash out of flowers. It's no way to live. The girl does not know wickedness when she sees it. What is she doing alone? Gathering nosegays? Using her mother's disregard to hack through the brambles? She measures her distance in lines, a sonnet for every 14 steps down a long haul of yellow leaves. They smell bitter as aspirin. In the nearly invisible rain, they twitch as if tugged by clear wires. What a pity she never arrives. For all she knows, the woman still waits for her wine and cake, her gown gathering dust from the sands of ancient Egypt, from stars burnt out a billion years ago. The girl is lost, not hunted, taken, but not into a hot, dark mouth. Nothing lurks in the fur's blue pins. Swallowed whole by trees, eaten alive in a manner of speaking, she walks toward a point none of us can see. It is blacker there than in the gut. From far off, her life rings like a thrown voice. Let it not be a fable for others. It's an installation. Wrens pinned like brooches to the trees, singing, their eyes glass beads. Shake a branch, be wary of what falls. In the unofficial spring, sunshine plays xylophone on the lawn. 
The trebly mouths, trebly notes are mouths singing oh, oh, oh. A paper boat leads the children downstream through countless shades of green, spring, grass, moss, forest. Light plus one green makes another. The exhibit rotates seasonally. Soon enough, the children will instead be foxes. The greens will rust. Someone will strike the wren set. But for now, their songs saturate the air. If the message is urgent, they'll tell again tomorrow. Do not rush to baptize your daughter in the well. Do not send your seven sons with a jug. They'll drop it and you'll curse them into birds, shoo them into a glass mountain far from any mention of their names. When you hear the whir of wings, do not think of the life you wanted but did not have. The lemony sun pressed on your eyelids, your tree jeweled with girls to pick and eat. I'll tell you how it ends. Your daughter will learn the truth. She will search for her brothers and bring them home. Maybe this is what you wanted, but do not give her bread, a pitcher of water, a little chair. Her guilt is beyond hunger, thirst, weariness. And these things will do no good in a world where children, despite their commonness, are a delicacy. The sun bears row after row of serrated teeth. The moon watches, eyes rolling as if from behind a painting, and says, I smell, I smell the flesh of men. But the stars give her what you could not, a way into the mountain, a key of brittle bone she will only lose. You might want to look away. She cuts off her finger and turns it inside the keyhole. Not everything can be set to music. Thank you.